Notre Dame fans, welcome back. It feels like it was just a minute ago we were here talking with you. I'm Brian Driscoll, the publisher at IrishBreakdown.com. That guy is Vince D'Addario, our football analyst. And we're going to have a couple fun topics to discuss today. We're going to talk about Notre Dame and the transfer portal. Then we're going to take it from a couple angles. We're going to talk just sort of like big picture and how Notre Dame needs to engage the transfer portal. Then dive into some specifics now that we kind of have an idea of where Notre Dame's roster is because of signing day. You know, some of the positions that they may need to look at or should look at, shouldn't look at when it comes to the transfer portal. And then we'll dive into the interview that Tommy Reese had uh, last week, Ryan Rosillo. So Vince finally had a chance to listen to it. Mm -hmm. We've been able to get through signing day and we want to address it. And and we want to address his specific comments, but then also just some bigger picture aspects of that. So uh, that is today's topic. Uh, so Vince, I want to first start off with the transfer portal and, and, you know, we've kind of said this, but we're going to just dive into it right now. And the fact that the, the thing that people have to realize is Notre Dame is never going to be able to treat the transfer portal like the free agency that it has been, that is meant to be and created to be, and that other teams are going to use it for. Right. Absolutely. And that's okay. I mean, Notre Dame is different, and frankly, that's why I enjoyed following Notre Dame as much, as long as I have is because Notre Dame is different. And the transfer portal, what it's becoming for many, many schools is, is, is it's free agency. It's a free agency portal, right? I mean, that, that's basically what it is. I heard somebody refer to it like the NFL. You try to fill some needs with free agency. Then you go to the NFL draft. You fill Which some more needs, and then day. you go back to the free agency. Right. That's not much different than some schools are treating college right now. No, that's now. exactly what it is it's right now. It's transfer portal. It's recruiting. It's right. back to the transfer portal. It's right. the same thing. And I would say that the NFL has more rules than mm-hmm. college does right now. Oh, there's. And, I mean, they have salary caps. They have yeah. tampering. Here's the crazy thing. They have tampering rules. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's things you just can and can't do in, in, in college football because there's zero leadership in college football. Zero. And exactly. that's going to be a focus of a future article and podcast that we're going to do. It, I'm so disgusted right now with the leadership of the NCAA and college presidents and just this whole entire thing. And, you know, people in Congress who care more about being liked and being cool and being all these other things, and they do right. about actually – you know, finding out ways to actually help young people as opposed to just creating new, you know, wealthy taxpayers uh, for, for different states, if, if we're being honest. So it, it really is disgusting. But here's the reality of it. OK, it is what it is right now. Right. And, and the way that it is right now, what, what people have to understand is Notre Dame cannot dive into the transfer portal the way that other schools can. And they're, exactly. they're just they're just things that that no matter how much the coaches may want to do that, no matter how much fans may want to do that. The reality is, is, is as Marcus Freeman said this the day he was hired, and this is something that Brian Kelly spent so much time fighting against as opposed mm-hmm. to just embracing. Right. Notre Dame's not going to change. Notre Dame's not going to all of a sudden say, hey, you know what? <clears throat> this is the reality of college football, so let's just go ahead and let anybody in. And if, the, if they only can transfer in nine credits because they took underwater basket weaving – and you know um piano and ba- ballroom exactly. dancing that's you know, we'll, we'll, it's okay we'll let them in no because notre dame unlike a lot of schools actually still cares this is a crazy thing to admit right notre dame actually still cares about developing young people right i, I know that's a crazy concept they don't just treat them as like hey you're our you know you're our 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 our, our trying to think of a you know our show pony or whatever it is we're just going to come bring you in and use you for what you, we can use you for and then send you along notre dame actually cares about students leaving as better people i know that's insane to talk about in college football right now but that's what notre dame cares about well, still. and, and people and are not going to change that and people have to understand transferring to notre dame is not an easy task right that's you, the whole point you, you have to have certain requirements like for example if you're going to transfer in as a sophomore you need calculus like that right. needs to have already been done. I, right. Again, I'm not saying that there's guys that can't do it, but what I am saying is it's a requirement. And there's a lot of schools out there that don't require that kind of thing. So it's scuba certification included with underwater basket waving. That's actually kind of impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, well done. <laughs> but but look, the whole thing is, is like, look, here, here's how a transfer process works. Okay. This is how transferring works. 
a student has to to apply to the new school, much like high school, and the right. school will look at his transcripts. The reality is you can't accept a transfer credit of a class that your school doesn't offer. Correct. Or doesn't have something similar. That they can, yeah, that's exactly right. That they right. could kind of say, we'll put it towards that. Right. So, you know, piano class, ballroom dancing, PE are not necessarily things that Notre Dame is going to say, yeah, we have nothing like that. Like, that's not a real class. I, I don't know what you were doing. in Notre Dame anymore. Right. But that's not a real class. Well, I'm talking about like college classes because now we're not looking at high school transcripts. No, no. I mean, they don't, college they don't have PE at college in Notre Dame yeah. anymore. All those people no are should. fired. No one freaking should. <laughs> are not fired. No, no one in, they, no one in yeah. college should have freaking that kind of thing in, in, right. in college, right? Because right. so, so all those people all, are teaching high school now. D- don't even get me started on you know, the, the gen ed requirements of college. Like once you get to college, gen ed should be a thing of the past. You start focusing on what you want to major on. I agree. But then you can't string out a, a program for four years and, you know, because if you just taught them what they needed for their degree, then they're not going to be paying money not, for four years. They're only going to pay school for two years as opposed to four years. And that, you know, that hurts the money. So, um, and I'm not hating on a piano. I took piano as a kid. I think piano is a beautiful thing. It should not be a, co- a, a class offered in college. Okay. If you want to learn unless a piano, you're a music major, unless you're a music major, right. but I would imagine if, you know, you'd kind of already know how to play the piano, <laughs> but, um, but the, the, a football player should be taking that. Uh, you know, and then, you know, does he show up? That's a whole different topic of conversation. You're going to get me fired up and I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into not that going right. down that road. Right. But the, the whole point is this is still supposed to be about higher education. And when, right. when, when a kid sends a transcript to a place like Notre Dame, they're going to look at that and be like, we can't accept that. We can't accept that. We can't accept that. And they're not being strict and, and, and disrespectful or snotty. It's that's how the rules are supposed to be. You know, like if it's just a normal student and not an athlete, all schools are that way. All schools look at a transcript and say, we don't offer that or anything like it. Can't accept that. That's how all schools are. Now, other schools are more accepting of it for student athletes because it's a it's a it's a business. Right. I mean, that's the reality. And, And so. You know, so so when you look at this, people are taking the classes I listed way too freaking seriously. You're missing the point. Right. right all right. I'm looking right. at the chat. You're missing the point. OK, <laughs> we, we understand um, that there's fun. Good stuff out Lord. There. I, we get it. But that you're starting about... left guards taking <laughs> piano and not showing up. It's not taking it because he want. it's not helping him. Be, whatever his right. degree is, unless he's a, like Vincent, unless he's a music music major. I assumed some of you would have known the difference in hyperbole. And me hating on piano class. Right. So right. take a deep breath, okay? <laughs> um, this is taking a complete left turn. I know. But it's like, seriously. It's like you can't use an example anymore because people are just going to like grab like, wait a minute. Hold on. I took underwater basket weaving, and it has changed my life. You know? Um, I just can't. Today. You know, seriously. So anyway... <laughs> The point is, is that's how it's supposed to be. Correct. You, you, there are classes you can and can't accept. Notre Dame is not going to change. Exactly. They're not going to start accepting they classes. Shouldn't. They shouldn't. And so that's going to hurt Notre Dame in regards to some of these kids that are going to these schools and being put into programs that aren't really going to help them graduate. Exactly. Now, that doesn't mean that's true of every kid. No matter where a kid go, a kid could go to Alabama. And if that kid values education and his family values education, they're going to demand that they get put in real classes. There are student athletes at Alabama like that. There are people that go to, you know, to Florida State. There are people. Myron Roll became a freaking Rhodes Scholar at Florida State because he valued education and he would not allow them to tell him, hey, you're going to take this. You're going to take that. Right. Exactly. There's obvious exceptions to every rule out there. Right. But not every kid has that kind of guidance. You know, again, I, I was I'm the son of, of two high school dropouts. Like when I went to college, they had no idea how to counsel me on what classes to take or not to take. That was a new experience for our whole family. And, and so not everybody has that. OK. And and not every kid goes to a school thinking, I'm going to transfer. So they just kind of do, hey, look, first semester, we need to take this, this and this so you can focus on football. OK, right. Cool. Right. Uh, and, and so. That 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 to me is is there are but there are kids that they can look at. The point is the, the the false thing that's been said about high school recruiting for Notre Dame is actually true for transfer portal. It, even more so, Notre Dame yeah. has to shop down a different aisle for the transfer, or yes. not shop down a different aisle. They can go down all the aisles everybody else is. There's just only a, a limited number of supply of the things that Notre Dame is looking for. 
Right. And that's the reality. So every time you see a kid enter the transfer portal, most people are going to think, oh, no, they should look at that guy. Well, I'm sure they will, but the reality is, is a lot of those kids, it's just, it's just not going to work out. Right. So and yeah, it's point, easier for, it, for transfer. It's easier for, yeah. for grad transfer. There reason, you go. There grad you go. transfers are easier because they have a degree. Correct. And Notre Dame can kind of just generally look at their graduation degree and say, yes, you, this has prepared you for the program we're going to accept you into. That's more of a, of a transition type of transfer, at, just like high school. High school is a transition to college, right? You've completed your work in high school. They're going to deem whether or not that academic workload prepared you for this, this level, right? And so then you accept them or not, okay? Because you can create sort of a whatever standard you want. A, a graduate transfers the same way. We're going to look at your, you know, whether we offer this major or not doesn't matter. What matters is the major you're applying for to get your graduate degree. And we'll find, we'll evaluate whether that prepared you for this or not. Did you handle a, a rigorous enough classwork, course load? Did you have enough success in the classes you took that we feel you could be successful as a graduate program? That's how the that's how the grad transfer thing works. A a transfer that has yet to graduate, you have to evaluate him based on the standard that you hold all your current student athletes to, because by rule you can't just you can't turn a certain class into another class and 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 just because the way that it works for eligibility is you have to have passed X number of credits. So a freshman has to be you know, have to have passed a certain number, you know, of, you know, of credits from your freshman year as a sophomore, right? I believe it's 24. You have to have passed 24 credits. Now you may take 15, you know, 18 a semester, but you only need to pass 12 and they have to be accredited classes right, exactly. to then be eligible. And, and usually you tell kids, this is why one of the first things you tell student athletes when they enroll, if you're only taking 12 hours, do not drop a class until you've added a class. Because what happens is if you are in 12 hours and you drop a class, you immediately become ineligible. And then when you add that class back in, you have to now go through the process of getting yourself eligible again. So what they say is add the add the one class, get you to 15, then drop a class, right? right. That's one of the most <clears throat> important things you tell people when you get there, right? And so it's the similar thing. If you haven't, if you don't have enough credited classes for Notre Dame, right? So if you're a junior and you and we're only accepting 15 of your credits. There's eligibility concerns. Absolutely. Beyond just can you are you have you, you proved that you can be successful in a place like yeah, Notre Dame? Right. And the other thing is you're gonna get here and you're not gonna be on pace to graduate. Well, Notre Dame's not gonna accept a student athlete that's not on pace to graduate. You know, I mean, that's just kind of how it's gonna be. So that that's the reality of the transfer portal for Notre Dame. And it's always gonna be that way. And and honestly, it should be that way. Because the bigger picture thing for me is. Notre Dame has to look at the transfer portal differently than other schools. And this is something that Brian Kelly didn't like. And this is one of the many excuses that he's used for leaving. Yep. Is, is this, well, you know, we can't compete in, because it's, to me, it's, it's lazy for programs like Notre Dame to do this. A, a program like Michigan state, a program like wake forest, that's a program, different. they need to do that because that's their chance to go get some kids. They otherwise wouldn't have been because exactly. those kids are going to allow them to be more competitive. A place like Notre Dame. I mean, how, Let's be, you know, Bama's taking a grad, a transfer, Eli Ricks, right? But they don't bring on a lot of transfers. They're still relying on Their developing the players that we are recruiting. Yeah. Ohio State's doing the same thing, right? Now, other schools are just bringing in transfers left and right to try to compete. That's fine. But for Notre Dame, it, transfers are going to be a, a, a real thing. And it's been that case for a long time. Notre Dame has had successful transfers for decades, right? I mean, even if you go back the last 10 years, I mean, Cody Riggs, Coming in that from Florida huge. as a grad transfer, that, that was huge, right? But Cody had put in the work academically. He took his academics seriously, and he was prepared to do it. We've seen, obviously, this year, we saw Kane Madden um, and Jack Cohn, and we've seen non-graduate transfers. So Lohi Gilman was a non-graduate transfer. Right. Came but he in comes from, the from a school Academy. that's academically rigorous. And, and a com- family. And compares to Notre Dame. Right. And a Absolutely. family. Absolutely. And so that's – and see, that's the difference. You're going to be able to get grad transfers in – but again, grad transfers are just hole pluggers for the most part. And that's – it's much, much harder to get into Notre Dame as a sophomore right. transfer, as a freshman transfer, you know, those kinds of things, which are going to be more abundant now right. because of the way you don't have to sit out a year, you know, all of those different things. But can they do? Can they get into Notre Dame under those restrictions? It's so much harder to get into right. Notre Dame as a transfer 
than it is as a high school student. It just right. is. And that's just a fact that everybody's going to have to live with. And again, as a fan of Notre Dame, if I take my media hat off as a fan of Notre Dame, I like that. That's right. why I'm a fan of Notre Dame. I, I, mean, I wish I is. wish more people would see. I I understand the 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 desire, especially from some of the younger Notre Dame fans, because some of the younger Notre Dame fans never have gotten to experience you know being a part of a championship team or or being part of a being a fan of Notre Dame when they are considered the elite team. Vince, you sort of have that. You know, you didn't really experience the '88 team, but you did experience right. like '90, 90, '91, '92, and '93. Yep. yep, and the expectations that came with that. And and of course, people even older than me who who lived through the you know with Coach Parsegian and and then sure. you know they 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 understand that standard and part of the reason a lot of people became Notre Dame fans is because Notre Dame is different and there's a lot of people that want Notre Dame to just kind of be like everybody else and to a degree Notre Dame has to accept realities of the of the landscape sure. they have to accept the reality of the college of of the college you know football playoff they have to accept the reality of they're the uh, really the only independent left now. The B, I think BYU is going to the B, Big Twelve, correct? Am I? Am, I, I feel like that is accurate. I and, believe and it is. So, they're like one of the five schools that yeah, I think that signed on to yeah, go. So, I think that's right. You know, it, it's just one. It's just one of those things where you have to accept this is the the new landscape of college football, but it doesn't mean you need to embrace it. There's a difference between embracing it and accepting. Accepting it is, okay, this is the reality. How do we still stay competitive by and, and to stay true of our mission, right? We have to stay true of our mission of what we are about, but we also have to accept the fact that we want to be competitive. We want to compete for championships. That's the balancing act that Notre Dame is having to juggle. Changing who they are is not an option, so it's not worth talking about, okay? Right. And it's going to make them different. But, you know, I think that the thing that Marcus Freeman and his staff have to do, the biggest thing is you have to embrace that, right? And it is what it is. How do we use it to our advantage in the ways that we are uh, permitted and allowed to do it? Which means, you know, you're, you're going to have to look for a smaller number of kids, which means Notre Dame has to embrace the transfer portal as a way to plug holes, right? Not as a way to, to turn over the roster because we didn't have the kind of year we thought we should have had. OK, or we made mistakes recruiting and developing. So now we so can we're, fix it by we're going to fix it by going and getting a transfer. Right. OK, they're, it's going to be like, hey, look, we've had some injuries. We've had some kids leave. We've had some this. We've had some that. And, and we need to fill a hole. Cornerback last year was one where it made sense that Notre Dame was looking at a Caleb mm -hmm. Evans. It was a need. Quarterback was a need. Kane Madden, that's a little different story, but hey, you know, they they thought they were getting a, a, an All-American, and, and I understand it. And, and I actually don't necessarily mind it. It's kind of like what we said at the time. As long as you're bringing him in with the thought of he's going to have to compete and win a job. Exactly. That's, okay. that's that's where they lost me. Right. You know what I mean? Was was I, I had no problem bringing him in. If they think that they needed depth, then that's their decision. Right. They're the coaches. They're, they're in the room with those right. guys every day. I have no right. problem with that. Come in and compete, but don't right. promise them a starting job. And I don't know if that happened. I'm not saying right. that it did. OK, don't promise them a starting job. And I don't, don't I don't believe be they did, but in their right. Yeah. But don't be unwilling to make a change if it's not right. working out. Right. That's what I'll right. say. So so what how does Notre Dame embrace the transfer portal? It is simply number one, always focusing on your own roster first. This is a twofold meeting for Notre Dame. Number one is developing your players. Number two, and this is something that was addressed in the press conference yesterday, is you got to make sure you're doing right by your players. So, look, do right by your players. What does that mean? Being honest, okay? Letting kids know where they, they stand. Making sure that you as a position coach and as a coordinator and to a degree as a head coach, it's hard for a head coach to do this because he has 85 kids, whereas Tommy Reese has like six or seven, including walk-ons. You know, the offensive line coach may have like 18 or 19. The D-line sure. coach may have that many. But running backs coach is going to have a little bit less. But the point is, you as a position coach, you need to have a relationship with parents, now, you need to set boundaries when the kid signs. Here's what – I want to have a relationship with you, but here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to have a conversation about playing time. You want to talk about playing time, you have your son talk to me. Okay, you come talk to me. But I want to know, hey, how's so-and-so doing? What's he, When he's calling home, what's going on? He's having an issue with his girlfriend. He does, his, he's having issues with his roommate. Uh, he, you know, he, he's, on, he's on a room. That's a, a big party room or, or on a floor that there's a lot of partying going on and he has trouble sleeping. You know, so those are things that you need to find out that's going on. And a lot of these times, these kids aren't going to come and talk to you about as a coach. 
because they think you just want to talk about football. You know, so so they're going to have, he, you know, uh, something that Marcus Freeman's going to have to demand. He's going to have to demand that all these coaches start embracing deeper relationships with players. And and he needs to hold up a guy like Mike Elston, for example, and say, if you're not doing it like that, you're not doing it right. You know, uh, I've been told Chris O'Leary's done a lot of that. Chris O'Leary's married and has a, a young child. But I've been told he's done a lot of stuff like that. Um, you know, Mike Mickens is, I mean, Marcus Freeman was doing that with the linebackers, right? You know, and and those things are important. And it doesn't have to mean that you're always bringing them over your house. I mean, some of these, you know, like Tommy, I don't know if Tommy Reese has a house that he can have 15, 20. I, don't, I have no clue. No idea. You know, no idea. Mm-hmm. But but it doesn't always have to be the same way. It's more about you You need to develop a tight relationship. Because if this if these kids truly believe that you have their best interests at heart beyond the football field, they'll come to you with more stuff. You know, and then and then you can you can go from there, right? That's important because what that's going to do is prevent you from losing a bunch of transfers. Because here's the thing you'll find out about most kids: if you're honest with them during the recruiting process, and you're honest with them when they get there, they will they will stay more off way more often than not. When kids leave is when you're not honest with them, and and when you tell them one thing at one time and then tell them another thing a week later or two weeks later or a month later. They're going to lose faith. If you tell one kid one thing, okay, let's just be real. There's a there's a specific position group at Notre Dame that's lost a lot of kids lately. Okay, here's a big part of the reason why. One kid gets told one thing, another kid goes in a meeting, gets told another thing, another kid gets told another thing. Well, guess what they do? They all talk. Exactly. And they realize they were told three different stories. And they're like, well, whose is true? And then they just realize he's just BSing us. Right. Right. And then a coach tells you this is going to be the case. You do what the coach tells you to do. And then you get to the first game of the season and it's like, oh, by the way, you're not going to be playing this week. What? Why not? And then he gives you some BS excuse about something he never told you you needed to worry about in the past. Oh, well, you're doing this. Guess what's going to happen? You know what? Forget this guy. I can't trust this guy. He's I'm I'm out of here. Right? That can't be accepted. Like, hey, guys, we're going to lose kids. Some kids are going to be so obsessed with playing time that they're not going to stay. And that is what it is. Okay. But we're never going to lose a kid because he didn't think we had his back. We're never going to lose a kid because he didn't think we cared. We're never going to lose a kid because we weren't honest with him. Right. Be honest with him. Because you know what? 99% of kids these days will, will, will accept the hard truth. And people think kids are fragile. They think kids are soft and weak. And, you know, I can't. No, kids want the truth. Even if they may not like it, they want the truth. And if you always give them the truth, most kids will stay. That's the reality. You know, and so that's something that that, that he has to demand. Because when you aren't honest with them, that's when you're going to start losing kids. And, and we've seen that at receiver in recent seasons. So, that's the, at the end of the day, that's where Notre Dame is going to prevent themselves from losing transfers because the best way to avoid needing to go to the transfer portal is to not lose kids on your own. Yeah, exactly. Why does Notre Dame looking at the transfer portal? Why do they have to look at the transfer portal at receiver right now? Because they lost so many of, their, of the kids that were already there. If Kendall Abdur Rahman, Jordan Johnson, Jay Brunel, and, and uh, who's Lawrence Keys were all still at Notre Dame. We're not worried about the transfer portal right now. It's about, you know what? Jordan hasn't been the player he's we thought he would be the first two years. It's time to get him going. And part of it's his fault. Put your foot up as behind and tell him to get going, okay? Hey, Kendall needed a couple years to develop. He moved from quarterback. Let's let's really focus this offseason on getting him ready to go because we're going to need him because we're losing so-and-so and so-and-so. Right. Right? That's going to be the key. Now, that's not always possible. Sometimes kids, we have, you know, hey, we had two freaky injuries this year. You know, like receiver. They lost two kids to ACL injuries during the season. That's just one of those freaky things that's yeah, going to put that, you behind schedule, right? Sure. Sometimes that stuff happens. And, you know, you had a big receiver class one year, and they all leave after their senior year. You know, some leave because they're grad transfers because they want to play. Other leave because leave they're going to the NFL. Some just, hey, I'm not playing football anymore. Yeah. And, and you know, you're young, and you're not sure. I mean, so there's always times when the, the transfer portal, hey – Treat Phil Dracovic right, and you don't need to go get Jack Cohn in the transfer portal. Exactly. And we're, you know, we're talking about a completely different quarterback situation mm-hmm. at that point. No question yeah. about that. So anyway, that's kind of – that's the thing is do right by your players, and the vast majority will still stay. 
And then you can deal with the stuff that comes up that gets them like thinking like I'm hearing like a lot of things and I will just address it now. Deion Colsey may transfer. Logan Diggs may transfer. Lorenzo Styles may transfer. I'm hearing all these different things. Number one is the reason we don't address those things every single time we hear it is because number one, we hear stuff like that every year. All the time. Somebody sent me a, a, a text message today of something Tom Loy put on his message board. And it was the same thing. Hey, if there's something that's got some meat to it, we'll put it out because we hear this stuff all the time. There's a reason we don't put it out because anyone that's been around a college program, whether it's covering it like you and I do, like Tom does, someone who's been a, a coach like I have, what you understand is just about every kid you have thinks about leaving as a freshman. Notice all the names being floated around as possible transfers. They're all freshmen. They're all freshmen. Do you know why? They're in their first semester or two of being away from home. And they're homesick. Yes. They're overwhelmed with the course load and all these different things. And it's and finals week. And, you know, all of that stuff. Always happens. Yeah. So yep. there's a reason we don't throw that around because now when a kid, when it gets thrown around, even when those kids come back, there's always that thing hanging over their head of, oh, well, you know, he, he almost transferred. Every I transferred after as a freshman. I, I left after my first semester of college for reasons that weren't necessarily about being homesick. It was other things. It was about losing faith in your coach. I'm not opposed to transferring, but if you put if I put out every kid that was thinking about transferring, you'd be like, oh my God, they're gonna lose the entire team. Yeah, the roster is done. <laughs> right. That's just how it goes. And that's right. why we don't just throw out speculation and rumors of every kid that we hear about transferring. If there's some if there's some meet to it if there's some some like hey look this kid is actively talking to coaches about leaving then there's something to discuss right but you know that's but the problem is you have you have you have some sites and then you have a lot of fans and different people that they want to they want to like break news right and, and they, they think just they're throw in the these rumors yeah, out there right. and and it's unfortunate and and you know it's like have, have you heard this yeah i've heard that why haven't you said anything? Because I could, I could, because if I, if I went out and reported every single kid that I've heard from a good source that's thinking about transferring, literally the people would think Notre Dame's on fire. Right. And, and you know what would happen? It would ha same thing would happen in Alabama. Same thing would happen in Ohio State. Same thing happened with Clemson. If you just reported every single kid that's thought about transferring, you, you, you could, you know what I could do? I could literally just go, hey, here's Notre Dame's freshman class right here. Okay. That's who's thinking about leaving after their freshman year. <laughs> You know, and it's yeah. like, and it's true every year. So, but the, the point is when it comes to the transfer portal, you have to focus on making sure you're taking care of your kids. Yep. Treat them right. Be honest with them. Hold them to a high standard and they're going to love you for it. Okay. Go talk to Oscar McBride. He'll tell you the same thing. Even back during the glory years of Lou Holtz. I mean, every freshman was like, man, what did I get myself in, in into? It's hard. So, so the, the the point is that that's just that's the most important thing for Notre Dame. Take care of your own. Then, when legitimate needs arise, you can be more targeted. Right. And if you're if you're more targeted, meaning we only need like two or three, it's easier for you to find the right people. Because if you need like, hey, we got to find eight transfers, you're going to make a lot more mistakes because yeah. you're kind of in because it stuff happens fast. I mean, these kids enter the portal. They don't enter the portal for three months more often than not. They enter the portal, and they're looking for a place now. Right. And and if you aren't targeted and you're scrambling around trying to chase 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 kids, you're going to make mistakes. But if you have two positions and you can find, okay, there's two. we need two receivers or we need a receiver and a corner, receiver and a line, safety, whatever, right? And we're just throwing things out there. We're not saying they necessarily need those. We'll get into those. And you say, okay. You for offensive coaches, I need you guys all focused on finding this. We need to be calling high school, and this is what this is what you have Dre Brown with help with. This is what you have analysts help with. This is why Notre Dame should have a transfer portal coordinator. Uh, honestly, that's one of the things Marcus Freeman needs to do is have a, have people have a staff, and it can only be like you, you can make it small, like three four people that are part of the recruiting operation, and and you know they work with the because then you need to go back. Hey, did we recruit this kid out of high school? Let's get his high school transcripts. You may already have those. You know what I mean. And so, but you need that staff working together on just scouring the transfer portal. Like who's in it today? You keep a database, all that stuff to where when you figure out who you want, you immediately say, okay, these are the kids that are in the portal wide receiver. You know, you, you, you can have a system that you just, Hey, here are the yeses. You know, these are the kids that we could pursue based on, you know, the things we know about them. 
and then and then okay now let's then you weed that down because okay this kid right. is doing this or, or whatever the case may be this kid's transferring because he got in trouble this kid's transferring because he got beat out this kid's transferring because he played and sucked you know there's just kids that you just check off and now it's like okay these are the three kids that we can look for at this spot and then you go the whole offensive staff goes in on that kid, right? Then you do the same thing on your defensive needs. That's how Notre Dame is going to have to handle it. And and but if if you start getting to situations where you start getting into situations where you're having to go find eight, nine grad transfers for Notre Dame, yeah, that's it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And what you're going to end up happening is you're going to end up taking like. Ivy, you're going to be taking like Ivy League kids. Well, you made a good point you know, that you can have Northwestern, like Duke, and the Ivy League as your feeder school. And Stanford, yeah. Right. That's not going to close any gap, right? To use a phrase that we use around here all the time. That's not a gap closing, uh, you know, way to go about things. And it's never going to work. That is never going to work. You're still going to be okay. You're going to get good quality kids, but you're not going to get guys. Again, is it possible that there's a guy like that can help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It'll, yeah. No but question. not 10 guys a year like that. That's that's a terrible way for a Notre Dame staff to set up their roster management. It's mm-hmm. not going to work. It's just not. Mm-hmm. So you have to have a different strategy. And I do believe that Marcus Freeman and his staff does have a different strategy. Right. And, they, and they've shown that. So, right. Uh, I'm not worried about it. It's more. This is more a diatribe towards the fans that are like, oh, get this guy, get this guy, get that guy. Well, the transfer portal. I and get it. Not, I got no I problem with it. I it's mean, just it just understand not realistic. That that's, yeah, that's. I mean, like, oh, maybe they should go for. And I'm like, there's a reason that kid went to the transfer portal, right? And that kid, and most of these kids, like the big name kids, they're not going to the transfer portal. Just well, we'll figure out what's next. They're going to the transfer portal because there's already been a couple schools that have expressed yeah. interest. Right, and and a lot of those guys want to get out of here by the second semester so they can have spring mm-hmm. ball, yeah. right? Because they're trying to play wherever they're going. So. Um, it, it's a very frantic situation, and this is the time where it gets kind of nutty. I mean, right. no question about it. So we're going to talk about some positions Notre Dame does need to target. I'm going to bring up some super chats first as, as we as we look at these. Matt, 2011 GT, what NIL deals can I get for subscribing to your channel? Or are there any showing Dell the door tours we can attend? Well, um, you can get a special deal uh, when you sign up for the channel or sign up for the message board. Is you get you get percentage off of the of the merch store, right? Well, if, NIL you, deal, if baby. you'll get a twenty percent off that you can use down the road, uh, and then you, we also have a Christmas special we're running for for me, the reason we're not giving the the thing out because it's only for subscribers to Irish Breakdown. And so, if you sign up and you want to use that, just shoot me an email. But there's also something on the message board about. I have to bump that up today so people can see it. Uh, but unfortunately, we have no NIL deals for you. Uh, nor <laughs> and, and do. people have asked about that. I will never do that with Notre Dame kids uh, because I feel as if I could, you know, pay a kid a few thousand dollars to to represent the show. But then it's like, it, I feel like that creates. There needs to be a. I'm fine having a relationship with kids. But what I don't want to do is get into a thing where it's like we're 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 getting to sort of a a business relationship, which is right. what that is, because then it's like, okay, but I got to be critical of you if you don't play well next week, right? How does that work? And that yeah, hey, it, here's the kid, you know, voicing this you know love for Irish breakdown. Listen, to Irish breakdown, and so you can listen to them be critical of the game I played on Saturday, you know. <laughs> and the other flip side is if I'm praising the kid when a lot of people like don't think he played well. Yeah. Then it's going to look like I'm favoring him because he's doing an NIL stuff, with right? Us. Because he's on. I payroll. just don't. It's just not a. And and I don't have a problem with anybody else doing that. They can do whatever they want. It's their business. For my business, I just feel like there, there needs to be, to be a, a healthy, professional, healthy right, distance between right, the two. Right, and that doesn't mean you can't have a relationship, but you they have to understand. Like, look, man, like, look, this is the deal. I've had relationships with Notre Dame players and. Uh, or parents and not former Notre Dame players and things like that, but they always understood I got a job to do, you know, and, and my job is to give honest analysis. Now, what those relationships help me do is sometimes it, it's maybe helped me some rem- remind me that, hey, maybe you can take some of the sting out of the manner in which you're criticizing this player. And that has been helpful for me uh, and something I think was needed, you know, um, to say, hey, look, man, you know, you can say this about me, but do you really need to say it about me like that? I'm like, you know what? You're right, because now it's coming across as personal, not just, hey, just here's why he missed that block, and he missed too many blocks, and he can't keep missing that many blocks. And and so uh, we won't be doing that. And and um, But as far as the Dell thing, I just uh, 
I'm hearing so many conflicting things from people. I don't even know what to believe anymore when it comes to what's going to happen with him next year. Yeah, seriously. I've heard so many different <laughs> takes and different things that I don't know what to believe at this point. And then Matt, 2011 GT said, Vince, you're looking good today. Don't let the haters get you down. Brother. So Mike <gasps> Sullivan's man, thing was he is upset with you, Vince, because you don't give a pluses. That is something uh, he's dealing with, 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 you know, with his child, cause his child, you know, is, doing work that you know hey i, I got a hundred on everything and you're not gonna give me an a plus you know <laughs> so which i understand because i don't i didn't like that either as a i get it but the thing is an a plus is a 4.0 and so is an a so it doesn't really make that much of a yeah. difference well it does when you put in the work and you feel like you yeah. crushed like it a, as much as it like can an be crushed. Pat on the back get well i mean but it. when you Back put in up. the work oh, let's see oh, rub some dirt some, on it you're gonna have fine. some problems here we're going we're to have some problems here. Christopher Morgan with Super Chat. Thank you. You guys are correct on Notre Dame class standards. Case in point, just a couple of my classic college sports movies, The Program 1993 and Blue Chips 1994. You guys left out swimming pool management. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh, goodness gracious. Hey, you know what? Maybe that's somebody's dream. But I just feel like if that's your dream, you don't need to go to Notre Dame to accomplish no, that dream. No, no, you don't. Matt Lass, uh, what are the rules on programs checking in on kids that may enter the portal but haven't yet? What do you do to what do they avoid taking a kids that's in now and losing out on better talent that enters the portal later? How do they avoid? I, I think the way they avoid that is just by taking more kids. <laughs> I mean, you know, just yeah. open up more room. I, I just think that's the only thing you can do. I, but I think that's why you have to be patient. But if you find a kid who's the right fit of what you need, you you take them. Right. And you, you get them now. And if, it, if another kid opens up and you have a scholarship, then you bring into it that position, you know, or or you say, hey, look, we, we made our decision and we're going to honor that decision. You know, we convinced this kid to come here just because something else better comes along down the road. You know, we're not going to then screw the kid over that we promised we were going to. And the, you start doing that, then school, you start establishing a sense of trust. Like, hey, look, you go to Notre Dame. They're going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. You know, we may not like the fact that Kane Madden played all year, but you know what? That's going to help the next kid that wants to transfer to Notre Dame. He's going to feel like, hey, they're going to, you know, they're not going to just kick me to the side when a somebody younger or that's got more eligibility comes along. They're going to have my back. Same thing with Jack Cone this year. There's a lot of people who wanted Jack Cone benched. We didn't, but there's a lot of people who wanted Jack Cone benched. I, or I say there was at one point in time where at this year I said, look, if Jack Cone's confidence is shot and it was look, then you need to start Drew Pine. Right. And, and, you know, but, but we they had stuck that conversation. With Jack. Right. Yeah. They stuck with Jack and, and Jack rewarded them for it. But th th that's going to help them at that point in time. But the rules checking in on kids, it's that they, they, I don't think there's, there are a lot of rules. I mean, you can contact the high school kids coach. I don't think there's any rules you can about contact doing his things people. like that. I mean, and, and yeah. th if they want to stop this, because there is a ton of talent and, you know, people, we're not, we're not doing this because of Dabo, but Dabo's right. I mean, this is, this is a corrupt system. You've got co now. I don't have a lot of sympathy for Dabo because Clemson is not exactly the cleanest program in the world, but I, I, I'm sympathetic to argue he's making, even if I don't necessarily feel sorry for Clemson, right? But the reality is, is this has been this. It's a dirty business. Mm -hmm. This has been true before the transfer portal. This has been true for a long time. It's just the transfer portal makes it easier. But you'll have, hey, if, if so-and-so were to leave, he could come play for us as a freshman. Right, exactly. And that message gets back to the kid. And and honestly, it's really hard to regulate that. Well, you just make you just make what it is. It's just – it's look, it's a deterrent. Number one, you got to set strict rules. You can't reach out to a, a high school coach. If you talk to a high school coach about – you cannot in any way reference that kid or, hey, you know what, I'm just saying hypothetically if, if – if there was a cornerback out on the portal, we'd be interested. Mm -hmm. Can't do it in any way. You can't then monitor every conversation. But if the right. if the if the restrictions are, it's kind of like when you cheat in the NFL. What do they do? They take away draft picks. They fine you and take away draft picks. Take away. We're gonna fine you. And for two years. Oh, and Major League Baseball to me has the the best way. If you cheat in the international market, you lose the ability to go out and get international free agents for like two three years. Is I believe that's still the rules in in uh, Major League Baseball, correct? I um, wouldn't know that the so, whole that, the whole international thing, right? Because you can only have like so much money to spend, and yeah, so really. It's... But I know teams that have gotten in trouble for things they they can't go on the mark on that market. Well, do that. Hey, look, you can't bring in a transfer for three years if you if you're if you get caught tampering. The punishment is. This and then the NCA needs to set an example of a few schools. Absolutely, it Do wouldn't that. be hard. Now teams will still always cheat, but always the, the 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 it's just so blatant and rampant now. Right, 
I would love That's for them the to be some rules so that they could at least say, hey, look, we're trying to curb this. You know, right. and, and if man. you get caught, we're going to have some But at this strict... point, the NCAA right. is just like, yeah, whatever. It's all good. Right. right. Where's that BCS money coming from? Or, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, yeah. The CFP money. Yeah. So so that's a big thing. That's a big thing for me. Now before before I move on, I want to give a spe- I, we have a, a we have a listener here that uh, that that who's a, a a great guy, and he has twin boys. Twins. Some of you may know them. They play at Notre Dame. Jason oh. and Justin Adamiola. <laughs> uh, today's their birthday, oh, that's and right. so we want to wish happy birthday to Justin and Jason and uh, their twin dad. Mr. Adamiola, Adamiola, great family. Love those guys. Older brother played at Bucknell, and the younger, the young, the daughter. I think she might be a senior in high school. Uh, she may be in college now, but she's actually, from what I'm told, the best athlete of the family. She's oh, a track. Boy. She's in track. She's exceptional. So um, well, definitely happy birthday to the boys. I, I meant to do that earlier, but I completely well, I can sympathize forgot. with a parent of twins. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Yes, you but, are a uh, parent of twins. It is it is a challenge, but it is also very rewarding uh, as well. It is. So happy I've birthday heard, to them. I guys. I have twins in my family. I don't. Yeah, and that's so. Yeah, but <laughs> not, I, I couldn't imagine. I love my twins more than anything, yeah. but I would never wish twins on my worst yeah. enemy. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just put it that yeah. way. It's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but no, it's it's. Um, I, and I liked how Mike Elson talked about, you know, I'm still recruiting. My next recruiting project is I'm trying to get Jace, Isaiah Foskey so and, Jace, and Jason Adamiola to come back to Notre Dame. He's like, look, man, this That's is what, what we're doing. Is. I love That's that. Honesty. Honesty. David Honesty. Knight, thank you for the super chat, David. Appreciate thank it you, David. so, so much. Do you think that some Notre Dame players feel like that no matter how hard they try, they're just never going to get a chance or say a realistic chance, even if you make a mistake? or you atone for it, then what is your advice for young guys? Oh, I think that absolutely goes on. And look, I am not someone that believes that that no transferring is should be allowed. I transferred right. after my freshman year because I had I started, I started six games, got hurt, missed the rest of the year, and and transferred. And I was started because I was lied to during the recruiting process. And when you lose that trust, you're 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 just not gonna be able to stay somewhere. Yeah. And it's the same thing if you don't – hey, look, coaches I, Coaches told me what I need to do. I've done everything I need to do, and he's not giving me a chance. Or I, I'm getting a chance, but I'm sitting behind these guys that I just know I'm not going to play over them. I, I'm going to leave. Go for it. I mean, I, I transferring sometimes is good for a kid. Sure. Hey, my mom is dealing with a sickness. Like when my mom got sick this year, remember, Vince? I'm, we had a lot of people praying for my mom. Like – Every day, I just wanted to get up and get in my car and go home and take care of my mom. That's just a lot of young men's just reaction like, hey, my family's in need. I got to step up, right? Yeah. I think that's in your DNA a lot of times. And so that may be a thing. There's a lot of reasons kids may want to transfer. And and I believe that, the and I, you know, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a story about this, the right way to handle trans, how, what the rules should be for transfers. And the one-time transfer thing is not the, just the open free agency is got to be done away with. And we'll it's get terrible. into the, the right look, way. To I do like it. the way They're, the NCAA did it before, but they were well, so inconsistent. Inconsistent, with their but they, they, there was just not enough. I didn't. I liked part of it. I like sitting out a year, but there's a lot of things that need to be done differently. I think I'm going to do something about that. But yeah, I, I think David is that every kid needs to do what's best for himself at the end of the year. Right. And, and every kid needs to sit down every year and assess where am I at? What are the opportunities in front of me? Because these kids get my dad likes to say this to me a lot. He gets real frustrated when he feels a kid's being screwed over because he knows what I went through in college. And he says, you know, these kids get one chance at this. That's it. One chance. Meaning you get one window where you're able to play college football. There's no do overs. Right. And and if a kid get, wants to get that opportunity, then he needs to go somewhere and, and get that opportunity that he doesn't think he's getting. Hey, I just want to go play like Micah Jones. When Micah Jones transferred, he went to Illinois State, not because he thought, well, that's my path to the NFL. It's like, I just want to play. I get one more chance at this. I get I right. got two years. I want to just no go play. With that. And if the NFL happens, it happens. But the NFL will find you no matter where you go. Mm-hmm. Just go somewhere you can play because you get one chance at that. Especially this day and age. Yeah. With all the technology that's out there and the the video. and I mean, it's – yeah, you have every opportunity. Every opportunity. I wanted to say one thing about about the the, the wishing twins. So I, uh, I was just told by a friend that uh, in the African culture, because uh, Jason and Justin's uh, dad is, is actually came here from Africa, so he was born and raised in Africa. He said in the African culture – that they believe twins is a blessing 
because they bring you blessings. And as someone who's got two sons at Notre Dame, I would say that that's worked I, out pretty well. I would say they he's have certainly been that. blessed yes. in a lot of different ways. No so, question about that. Uh, but I will say this, having a conversation with him also, I think that his reaction was uh, initially was the same as yours. All right. So transfer portal for Notre Dame, because I want to get to Vince's thoughts on the Tommy Reese thing. Uh, I think quarterback is a need. I was sent a, 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 a DM today of a, a kid from Dartmouth who was a really good player at Dartmouth that's in the trench portal. I, I would try to reach out to a kid like that and let him know, like, look, yeah, you can compete. I mean, if you come here and you're just flat out better than everybody else, yeah, we're going to start you. But we're not bringing you here with the, the thought yes. of you're going to start. And I have no problem with that. Right. I, where I would have a problem is, is if they go get a kid who – Bo Nix, is going to want to start. Right. I mean, because right. I'm not making any promises to that because I think the starter's already at Notre Dame. I'm not only not making promises, I don't want that competition – Right, because I'm all for competition, but number one, you've got two really good quarterbacks that need the reps, and if you bring in a third guy that needs the reps, you're taking away from those exactly. other two kids. Exactly. Develop the two kids you have. Bring in somebody for depth. Like, look, if That's you want to come here and get your masters at Notre Dame, and you want to, you know, be a part of the football program, and you want to be a part of this culture, let's have a conversation. You know what I mean? But that needs to be understood. And if you're just front. flat out better, then we'll play you. But you're not gonna, you're not coming in here getting equal reps with the other two kids. Right now, that's going to make it harder to get a kid. I get that, but that's you know that's why you should have handled your depth chart a little bit better in the first place. Correct. I, I think that wide receiver at this point in time needs to be it. And and people have said if everybody comes back, Notre Dame is fine. That's not it's not that easy because number one, they're not fine because receivers also need to be part of the the scout team, right? So I mean, you need depth. Notre Dame likes to be a three receiver offense. You need at least three guys at each position. If everybody comes back, they would not have that. They would, they would have eight. they would have Joe Wilkins, Kevin Austin, Avery Davis, Braden Lindsey, correct? They would have the three freshmen, that's seven. And then because they didn't sign a Morgan Walker, they'd have eight. You don't have eight. enough for a three deep. Okay. And and then the, beyond that, beyond that, you have two kids, if they all come back, two kids coming off of severe knee injuries in Avery Davis and Joe Wilkins. You don't know if Avery Davis is going to be good by fall camp. He got hurt in November. Right. You don't know that he's going to be ready by August. And and when is he going to get back to full speed? We don't know the answer to that, right? And so there needs to be some protection there. Joe Wilkins was already a kid that had a little bit of trouble with separation and things like that. He was a good, solid player, but now he's coming off of a knee injury. We don't right. we don't know how that's going to be, right? And then Braden Lindsay has his own. So you could say that they'll be fine, but that's assuming everything goes perfectly. And when was the last time that happened anywhere? Injuries are a part of the game of football. And so that's why depth is there. Now, at the same time, if everybody comes back, there's not a need for someone to come in and be a guy. Right. You, you know what I mean? Right. Exactly. Um, it's and, a depth piece. And and the yeah. guys in the transfer portal, it's like there aren't a whole lot of 60 catch thousand yard guys in the transfer portal. Now, let's say Marvin Mims goes, you know, from Oklahoma. I'm just using him as an example because it popped in my head because I'm thinking about a kid that was originally committed to Stanford. So there's probably a good chance he's academically oriented. Let's say he enters the portal. That's a kid you look at and say, because with all due respect, that kid's better than who we have now at that position. You always look at that. That that right. should always be part of the conversation. The reason they say, well, you just said the different book. I don't think there's a quarterback out there that's better than Tyler Buckner. I think there's quarterbacks out there that have more experience than Tyler Buckner. I don't think Spencer Rattler's better than Tyler Buckner. I think he's more experienced than Tyler Buckner. Same thing with Bo Nix. Same thing with Keaton Slovis. First of all, Keaton Slovis is incredibly overrated. Number two, the next time he goes to a season without getting hurt is the first time he goes to a season without getting hurt. Okay, you don't bring that. That's not the kind of that's kid. That's not you bring the kind in. of guy you want. No, it's, it's not. It's not. It's and not. you don't run an offense that fits right. what he does, in my opinion. So, so but anyway, go ahead. Since you, you went back to quarterback, I, I just want to address this real quick you know why quarterback though we have four can't forget ron jr first of all he's the third uh or is he leaving he's not a depth piece for you no he's not a depth piece is someone that if his numbers called can go win you a football game but ron paulus couldn't win high school football games don't let's no. I'm just, okay he, it's just a fact okay that's but a that, fact that says a lot about his high school team okay you know like as i when i was a junior we went to the state semifinals when i was a senior we went three and three and seven because our coach sucked okay i'm just making the point that the fact is he doesn't have the skill set and and my view and in vince's view to to be a starting quarterback at notre dame to win you football games correct okay that that's that's the fact of the matter and and had hit if it I'm not going to say what I was going to say because it's going to come across as mean, and I'm not trying to be mean. I I think I've 
heard nothing but about good things about Ronnie as a kid. Nothing but good things oh, about him as a me kid. Too. Absolutely. He's just not a Notre Dame caliber player. Right. And, and, and not a guy, especially as a redshirt freshman. Uh, who didn't practice even one time this season. Like he wasn't dressed one time all season. He, 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 even my, by the end of the year, he wasn't practicing. He wasn't dressed the other day when I was at practice. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, again, that, that that's no fault of his own. He was injured. Right. He had a foot injury, I do believe. But again, he's no experience whatsoever. Right. Even at practice, so that right. again, I don't. That's right. just not a, a place where you want to go. I think the only other position is if you. The, here's the thing: Notre Dame. There's a couple positions that Notre Dame may need to look at if they lose players. If they lose Isaiah Foskey, I would at least keep my eye open for a, an, a, an edge rusher. I, I just, I think there's there's a need for depth there. If you, if you lose if you if Foskey comes back, you're okay. If you lose him, I would say you need to look there. Vince, the other position I would look at is safety. That's the one that and sticks then out to me. If if there was a corner that was in a Caleb Evans type of corner, I would look there too. But elite has has to be elite because like that guy is our best the best right, player because that, Notre Dame has right. depth. You don't right. need a depth piece at corner right, right now or safety. You, yeah, you you need somebody that's going to come in and start right. on day one. Right. And, and a legit starter on right. day one. Not- Early in the season, Vince, that's not the story. Early in the right. season, safety is a place where you needed a guy to come in because you didn't have numbers. Right. What we have to remember is the, the 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 story has changed since you moved Ramon Henderson and since they moved Ramon Henderson and Xavier Watts. So to your point, you're spot on. Those are positions where I'm only bringing in a guy if he's a dude. Right. That is it. That's it. There, there's no need for depth there same thing with offensive line you know look if a if a if a kid wanted to transfer here to play tackle or guard or center and and he was like wow i can't believe that kid wants to come here he's a future first round pick would i consider bringing him in yeah i'd consider it i'd have to be really convinced though you know safety in corners a little bit different because i there's a lot more uncertainty because we haven't seen a lot of these kids play or if a kid wanted to come here, like Nick McLeod, I don't know if I'm bringing in Nick McLeod this time. You needed him right. two years ago. You did. I don't know if I'm bringing him this time. If there's a guy that's like a, a Cam Hart caliber player that wants to come in and uh, Caleb Evans, yeah, that guy I'd consider. Right. So those are really the only positions where I think right now the portal is necessary. Now, if they lose players, then, then we have a different discussion. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I completely agree with let's that because we don't know what those left or or somebody a running back gets hurt in yeah. spring ball. Right now, you need to look at the transfer portal for a running back because you don't have the depth. But right now, with where things stand at running back, bring back the kids you have, and you're good. Yeah, absolutely. Now, at I, all these yeah. positions, I'd be open to I'd be open to any position if you have the numbers for a kid that wants to come in and say, "Hey, look, I just want to come here. I want to be. I want to battle. I want to compete." But I, I want to get a master's degree from Notre Dame. If you have room for a kid like that, I'd be open to it. Assuming you don't have walk-ons of your own that you want to give scholarships to, like Michael Vincent got one today, which was pretty cool. Um, I, I, I tweeted, I said, look, I said, Michael Vincent didn't get a scholarship because he's just a you know cool story. This kid's been a really good part of the special teams the last two years. No doubt. And the thing I said was, have you heard Michael Vincent's name the last two years in the game? Nope. And, and that's, that's exactly what you, what you want from a snapper. <laughs> that's what you want. You don't ever want his name being mentioned because that means he is doing his job every single time. And and that's obviously been a big thing. So huge props to Michael Vincent for, get, Vincent for getting that today. But that's who I'm taking care of first are those kids. If, if, if I'm just bringing a receiver in for depth, I'm giving Matt Salerno a scholarship first. Then I'm going to see if I have one for that guy. You know, if I'm bringing in a receiver, it's because it's, you know, you you need the numbers, but it's you're going to bring in somebody to compete. You know, uh, that's kind of how I would look at it. But anyway, Vince, before we go, I know we don't have a ton of time on this, but I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on on Tommy Reese's uh, Ryan Rossillo. Sure. Interview. I, first of all, it was it was a great interview. You can tell that those guys are friends because it was not a guarded interview if that makes sense like Tommy Reese was super comfortable having that conversation with Ryan Rosillo um and I think that made it that much more of a of a a great listen 
right? Mm-hmm. Because he was honest. He was like brutally honest at well. I mean, he even reminded Rasilla that he was arrested in high school or in college, and that's why he didn't play and didn't get to. Go he to said Ireland. you got beat out. I think Tommy was more. Tommy thought it was more offensive to be told that he was beat out. Yeah, I think you're right. Arrested. I think like, you're no, right. I didn't get beat out. I got arrested. I was arrested. <laughs> That's a competitive dude right there. You'd rather people think you got arrested, they yeah. got beat out. That's I, I that, just thought that was awesome. That's hilarious because it's so true. You are so right about that. That was great. Uh, but I thought that that was funny. And then he brought up the fact he's like, yeah, he goes, I'm over two going to Ireland. He goes, I didn't get to go the first time, and it got canceled mm-hmm. the second time as a coach. Mm-hmm. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny. But it, what stood out to me, number one was the timeline because he went through it like detail of the timeline from the end of the Stanford game through Marcus Freeman being named head coach and like everything that went down. And it was illuminating to me, number one, because he was with Brian Kelly pretty much nonstop all day Sunday uh, and then into Monday. And he's like, yeah, he goes, I didn't really notice anything. He was like, looking back, there may have been a couple things, but he's like on Monday, things were just off. You know, we skipped a guy you know, that we were going to go to and, you know, all these things. And then he talked about the plane ride home on Monday mm-hmm. um, and how awkward it was because he knew he had a job at, L- at LSU and the other guys didn't know what their future was going to be. And Del like, Alexander was one of those guys too, by the way. Was it? Because he didn't mm-hmm. mention who those coaches were that were on the plane with him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's like, it was such an awkward plane ride and, you know, all these different things. I was like, wow, that's really honest because – as an assistant coach, you hear your head coach is leaving. You're now unemployed and you need to figure out what your next move is going to be. Um, and so I thought that that was really interesting. And then the other thing that struck me about the timeline was that uh, Jack Swarbrick contacted Tommy pretty much right away and said, hey, can we meet on Thursday? And Tommy's like, that's too late. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that that's too late. We can't meet on Thursday. And so he flew back and they met at He wanted to meet with Tommy after meeting with Marcus. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. For all the people that said, "Well, what he met with Tommy first, so clearly keeping Tommy is more important than, than Mark." No, Tommy cleared that up. Right. And and Tommy was like, "I made it over to Jack's house at ten thirty, and we talked for two hours, and you know all these different like that was illuminating to me because Tommy understood that there's there needs to be a decision made mm-hmm. quickly, right? Because he either needs to you know poop or get off the pot with LSU. I mean that's um trying to clean it up there obviously but um you know he's got to make a decision and there was a great stretch of time where he just he was going to lsu i mean that that's what was going to happen um until he had that conversation with jack and the you know the financials came through and like all of the you know the contractual stuff um but he's like i just stayed in my house and, and i had i ordered in and i had some you know my dad came over and we talked and it's like yeah that's right your dad's on staff and he's a great sounding board you know, all those different things. Like, I didn't even think about the fact that he could talk to his dad, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he called all these people about LSU and what it would be like and all those different things. And so I thought that that was very, very interesting. And then his relationship with Marcus Freeman and how he didn't want an arranged marriage mm-hmm. of him being the offensive coordinator and then somebody coming in and being forced to have him as their offensive coordinator. He's like, that doesn't work. He's like, there's a couple of guys that might have worked with. He goes, but I knew that it would work with Marcus. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was pretty – I mean, they clearly trust each other. They clearly uh, have a good relationship, which I think we've all seen over the past week or so. Uh, But the fact that he flat out said it, he's like, I trust him big time. And Mm -hmm. I I knew that it would work. And then he – I can't remember the exact verbiage, but he basically said he had handcuffs on. When he was the offensive, he coordinator. basically said he was I getting more autonomy. Was. Yeah, He's, more, he wants more autonomy in the offense, right? And that was important to him. Right. He's like, as a defensive, what that, head what coach, that, yes, yeah. what that means is basically Tommy was still working within the, the the parameters of what Brian Kelly wanted. Now, Brian, you know, Tommy was still putting the game plans together and was still the primary play caller, but it was within this is the framework of what Brian Kelly wants. Now, if Tommy and, and Marcus Freeman said, "Look, if Tommy has conviction about something." then come to me and and let's do it, you know, because he needs to be able to do it. The other thing about it too, is part of the timeline was sped up because what I've been told by, by multiple people now is Mark is Brian Kelly put deadlines on in an attempt to Uh, force their hand. 
this is a savvy move by Kelly in an attempt to force Actually their hand is. and not give Notre Dame time to let this thing play out. Tommy couldn't wait. Elston couldn't wait. These guys couldn't wait on Notre Dame to go through a two week search and then they settle on Marcus Freeman as the head coach. If they'd have done that, Tommy's gone, Elston's gone. It's just Marcus. Yeah. Lance Taylor might be gone. I mean, these coaches are getting t- deadlines put on them, especially for Brian. Brian Kessler, I need to know this time. And and so g- kudos to Jack Swarbrick yeah. just for, for, first of all, not allowing Brian Kelly to force his hand in, in panicking into a decision, but then saying, okay, we got to figure out what we're going to do. Let's speed the entire process up and ultimately came to the right decision. But I thought that yeah. was part of it too. But the, back to the handcuffs thing. Uh, yeah. Vince, it was all, the autonomy, which yes. to me, I felt like that when you combined that comment with what we've heard from a lot of sources within the program about Brian Kelly basically checked out after, at, you know, middle of the season, because it was it was made very clear to Brian Kelly, you're not getting another contract extension. Go win a title, then we can talk about it. Right. That's what pissed Brian Kelly off. He felt he should be getting more money. He didn't like the last contract he signed less than a freaking year ago. Right. And so, because that's who Brian Kelly is, it's it's all about Brian Kelly and his recognition and, and his money and all that kind of stuff. Right. He basically checked out. He knew he was leaving. He wasn't coming back. Mm-hmm. And Brian Kelly wasn't super invested in this thing when he thought his future was wrapped up at Notre Dame. Right. And that's when you saw. The, the offense, especially under Tommy Reese, take off. And it, again, not completely where it needs to be, but you start – I mean, it went from 5.2 yards per play to 7.1. You know, 25 points per game to 38. You know, we saw it really take off, and it's not just about they played bad teams. Yeah, There's no. more to it than And that. it was clear – and anybody that knows anything about football could see the difference in the offense, right? And it was you – know, of course, Brian Kelly took all the credit for it, but at mm-hmm. the same time – you could tell that there was a difference, and now looking back, we can t- we know what that difference was, and mm-hmm. and it was very illuminating. Like the conversation was very illuminating, um, and, and listening to it, and and look, kudos to to Marcus Freeman for allowing Tommy to go on these different shows and and speak with candor. Uh, I I think that's huge because you're getting to know Tommy Reese and who he is uh, more so than you ever would have you know, under the the previous regime. Right. And I I think that's big. I think that's huge. Um, because look, Tommy wants to be a head coach someday. Right. Mm -hmm. And Marcus Freeman understands that too. That's not the first thing in the forefront of Marcus Freeman's mind. It's like, well, I got to make sure that Tommy's going to be prepared to be a head coach and all these, that's not what he's thinking. But at the same time, he's allowing Tommy to go out and be himself and put himself out there, which I think is big, you know, because look, Marcus Freeman's success at Notre Dame is now directly tied to Tommy Reese. Mm-hmm. It's directly tied to him. And there's no mm-hmm. way around that. And so how he handles that relationship is going to dictate what that future relationship is going to be and their success at Notre Dame. And so far, it's been like two weeks, but so far it's been handled really, really well. Mm-hmm. I thought the the other I, I think that the thing I liked is Tommy's 29. He hasn't ha- he doesn't have a decade of of playing the game basically so what we saw from tommy reese was that's just tommy reese being tommy reese right not trying to like you know put on the facade of i'm a coach and i have to i'm trying to impress people you know it's just this is me man this is this is just me being me and like one thing i kind of joked to a buddy of mine we were talking about said the only thing i would have told him to do differently is like you know the language you know you do want to be a head coach someday so maybe maybe clean the language up a little bit, you know what I mean? But I, but if it comes, if, if that comes with him just not being authentic, then I'd rather just have to deal with the language. Right. Uh, but I mean, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was authentic. Yeah. It was real. He was talking about, he, I mean, he, he's like, he basically was, he, he was leaving. I mean, he was leaving in his mind. He was gone. He was talking to people about living down there and what's it like being down there. I mean, it was so obvious that he was gone. And, and at the end of the day though, it's just coming back and, and, I think it's also clear that he didn't he didn't stay because he doesn't like Brian Kelly, respect Brian Kelly. I think it was a bit more about Notre Dame and Marcus because otherwise, why is he yeah. considering following Brian Kelly to, to Louisiana if he doesn't like Brian Kelly or respect Brian Kelly or screw Brian Kelly, right? Right, exactly. And and it was more about, you know, that is my coach. That is a guy that get you know that coached me. That's a guy that gave me a chance as a coach. Yeah. 
gave me a chance as a 27 year old coordinator that a lot of people wouldn't given. There's a re- clearly was a respect there, but I also got a sense that he didn't like how Brian Kelly handled his departure. That he didn't say it, but it just it, yeah. It, I mean, he kind of danced around it, which right, kind of he's gives a respectful because he respects. Kid. Yeah, right. exactly. And that's exactly right. He's right. like, well, I don't know if there was really another way to do it. You know, but, but he you, also didn't like it. He said yeah, exactly, yeah, he didn't right. like it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I just I love the authenticity of it. I think that it makes him very relatable because Tommy doesn't play the game. You know, when he did the interview with us this summer, he was like just like chilling like this the whole. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and he was on another <laughs> interview the other day, and he had like a hoodie on. It's just you're getting the authentic Tommy Reese, and I hope that he continues to have success because yes. that's going to stay right. right? And, and and that's what I'm like when Marcus Freeman acts the way he acts, I've talked to people that known him. They're like, no, that's actually just how Marcus is. That's not him putting on the, you know, right. I want to be related. That's just who he is. I like, I want more of that. I yes. feel like there's so much fraudulent stuff in college football and, 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 and it, maybe I'm just jilted because I've been, covered Notre Dame for 12 years with Brian Kelly, who was the one of the biggest, like, phony. And we, yes. this isn't new. I'm not saying it because he left. I've always complained about this. You just don't know what to believe. You don't – like with Tom Maurice, if he says something, you're like, yep, that's pretty much – I mean, he may be leaving some details out that aren't our business, but, yeah, that's pretty much probably how it went down. I loved it. I loved the yeah. authenticity of it. I loved uh, just – just he just like, look, this is what happened, right? And, and you know, he talked about how he hated Notre Dame growing up. And you know he he's from Chicago and and you know his yeah, he's brother like my, went to my UCLA. Dad hated it. My grandfather yeah. hated him. Now they him and his dad both, both work at Notre Dame. <laughs> and and he, but know, but right? what he said was something we hear a lot. I mean, Vince, I've heard this story a thousand times. I hated Notre Dame until I visited it. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. He's like, man, I got there and he's like, this is just a different place. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've said. And and people say, why does Mike Elson always talk about how they need to get people on campus? That's why That's right why. there. Because you don't really understand Notre Dame until you go. It, it, you, you never truly understand. And I would say this to every Notre Dame fan that's never actually been at Notre Dame. If you think you love Notre Dame now, hmm. wait till you step on campus. It mm-hmm. just It's almost kind of like different. if it was a movie, you'd have like this like really like angelic music playing. It's, it's like it's a just ground got this, swell. And just, yes. Yeah. It's just really like a yeah. – it, it, it's a really interesting thing. So, so I, I love the authenticity and he confirmed some of the things that we've been talking about when it comes to the offense. Yep. Um, you know, so. Yep. I, I loved it. Yeah. And I, I know you got to go. So uh, we're going to wrap that up. So Vince, we'll be back tomorrow for. Mailbag Friday. That's right. We, we, we may do something tonight. We, we still haven't figured it out. So that's why you need to hit the notification bell because if we're going to do a show tonight, you're going to be made aware that that is going on. Uh, you, you, you just, you just got to notify. You have to subscribe. You have the notification bell. I, there's nothing else I can <laughs> say to that because that's how you're going to know it is. Check out the Irish Breakdown message boards. Uh, check out the Built Bar. Use the Irish Breakdown promo code. If you are a member and you can't find the, the Christmas thing, just shoot me an email. It's 25% off your entire purchase. It's for members only. Uh, we're going to have a couple other things for members only that are going to be really fun and exciting, but I'm not going to tell you what those are because I need to make sure that I can actually get them done first before I start advertising for it. So um, anyway, everybody have an awesome rest of your day, and we will uh, we will talk to you all again very, very 